Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to FOF and good to see you in person. Today, let me introduce our fund manager Rukun Tarachandani. And this is a topic which is very dear to him. And this is something he only can understand. So I will let Rukun speak about a very interesting topic of AI and machine learning. Rukun, over to you. Yeah, so a decade back, there was hardly any interest in this topic. But over the past two, three years, the interest in this topic has suddenly exploded. And so uh, if you see, Satya Nadella has said that AI will shape everything that they do. Sundar Pichai has said that it will make us more productive than we ever imagined. And Jeff Bezos has mentioned how it will help us solve problems that we earlier couldn't. But it's not just larger than life statements by many of these business leaders. If you see companies in their day-to-day -day businesses, they are actually starting to use AI. And if you see banks have been mentioning how they are using AI for credit models. Insurance companies have been mentioning how they are using AI for claim assessment. We have companies like HUL mentioning that they are using AI for demand and commodity forecasting. So companies across sectors are starting to use AI. And this presentation is a attempt to demystify this topic a bit. So uh, let's start with the first segment, which is the history of artificial intelligence. Now, considering that the topic has suddenly become popular in the past few years, it might be tempting to believe that this is a new topic or this is a new field of study uh, or the major breakthroughs have only just happened. But if you actually look at it, this is actually a very old topic of study or a very old field. So MIT made this documentary called Thinking Machines way back in 1961. And it is interesting that 60 years back, they were asking some of the same questions that we are asking even today. How can we make machines intelligent? What will be the impact when machines become intelligent? What will be the impact on humans when machines become intelligent? So people have been grappling with these questions for almost decades now. And if you look at the history of this field, so just like in equity markets, we have booms and bursts, bull markets and bear market. AI has also seen its share of booms and bursts, which the AI community or the AI researchers prefer to call as AI springs and AI winter. So the field started in 1950s, or somewhere around that. This is when you had the first artificial intelligence conference. Neural networks, which are very popular today, actually were conceptualized way back in 1950s. And this was also the time that was just after the World War. So defense industry and the defense ministries in US, UK, they were very enthusiastic about the applications of AI to, de to defense. And a lot of the funding for AI at that point of time came from defense. For their part, the researchers also made tall claims. They, Herbert Simon, which was, which is, who is one of the pioneers of this field, he said that in 20 years, AI will be able to do stuff that any human can do. So within 20 years, we'll, AI will reach that position. But about two decades later, somewhere in the mid 1970s, people started to realize that their claims didn't materialize. A lot of the applications that were promised did not get delivered. Consequently, defense departments drastically reduced the funding. People started to realize that, you know, this field will take a lot, they will have a long gestation period and it went through a period of AI winter. Then again, in the 1980s, you had AI once again becoming popular, this time through a research breakthrough or through systems that are called expert systems. Uh, we'll look at expert systems later on, but for now, just know that it is one kind of an artificial intelligence system. So uh, expert systems became popular. Again, claims were made that expert systems will be useful in a lot of industries. There was a specialized hardware market called Lisp machines that was developed for expert systems. Again, looking at the promising new breakthroughs, new technology, funding again for expert systems increased. But then again, in the subsequent decade, people realized that a lot of applications that were promised did not actually materialize. Funding again reduced, the market for this specialized hardware collapsed. And finally, 
from mid 2000 on onwards we once again have an ai spring this time led by machine learning we'll look at why or what is driving this current ai boom before that uh, just to recap so during ai springs you have re research breakthroughs you have increasing applications of new research you have funding increasing but you also have a lot of overpromise and hype so this is actually an article in new york times from 1958 wherein the us navy claimed that they had developed a device that would that was designed to read and grow wiser now obviously this desire this device actually never materialized so uh, it it shows the kind of hype that can happen during ai springs and similarly during ai winters people can get extremely disassociated with the field so this is a new york times article from 2005 and which mentions that at that point of time computer scientists actually did not want to call themselves artificial intelligence researchers even if they were doing research in that field because anybody who called himself an artificial intelligence researcher was assumed to be a wild eyed dreamer so uh, like equity markets the field goes through its ups and downs uh, if you want this there's a paper called a brief history of ai that goes through all these historical cycles of ai um, that's uh, you can google it and it's uh, freely available to download and read so looking at uh, having looked at the history of ai and ml uh, let's just take a brief look at what ai ml actually is now colloquially we use the terms ai and ml almost as if they are synonymous or as if they are the same but actually artificial intelligence is a very broad term it simply means machines who have an intelligence or machines who can make decisions and predictions now as i said one kind of artificial intelligence systems are what are called expert systems so expert systems is essentially a system wherein the intelligence or the knowledge comes from a external domain expert so for example if you want to build a system which can diagnose a patient based on his system based on his symptoms then you get a doctor you ask the doctor how does he diagnose his patients the doctor will tell you that if a patient so shows symptoms a b c d then the underlying condition is x so once you have these rules you encode these rules in a software and that is essentially what an expert system is so your intelligence is coming from an external domain expert you can contrast this with machine learning wherein the intelligence comes from data you simply feed data into the algorithm and the algorithm on its own finds the rules behind that data so you don't explicitly program the algorithm any rules the algorithm itself is finding the rules finally uh, one of the kind of machine learning that has become extremely popular these days is called deep learning and for the purposes of this presentation you can think of deep learning just as one kind of machine learning what separates it from some of the other techniques is that deep learning works best when you have more data so if you have a problem wherein you have lots of data then deep learning will give you better results than some of the other machine learning techniques um now looking at some of the broader problems that machine learning can help you solve so machine learning problems can be broadly divided into two categories one what are called supervised learning here you are learning from data wherein the input and the output is clearly defined as we look at some examples this will become more clear on the other hand in supervised un, in unsupervised learning your data doesn't have a clear output again this might appear confusing because if the data doesn't have an output how does the algorithm know what to do with it uh, again when we look at the examples it will become more clear so supervised learning can be classification and regression so let's start with classification classification is a problem wherein you want to predict the class or the category of a particular data so one of the earliest examples of or uses of machine learning was in the postal department so people would write postcards and on those postcards you would write the pin code manually 
Now, it would need a human to understand the number that was written on the pin code. The computer was not able to understand the handwriting. So, uh, a big problem or a big challenge for machine learning researchers was how to make the computer see what a handwritten word is. So, when you look at this zero, it is clear to you that this is a zero. But when a machine looks at it, it doesn't see a zero. So, if you've seen the movie Matrix, wherein the machines look at everything as a series of numbers, it is actually not very far from true. So, the way machines look at it is, this image is composed of many pixels. In this particular case, it is composed of 28 pixels by 28 pixels. So, essentially you have 28 by 28, that is 784 numbers. Now, each pixel, since this is a black and white image, has a number associated between 0 and 1. So, 0 for a completely black pixel, 1 for a completely white pixel, and if it is a gray pixel, then it has a value between anywhere between 0 and 1. So, the machine actually only sees those 784 numbers. So, in this particular case, it's a 9. The 784 numbers from the, on that 9 are fed into a model and the model ultimately tells us that it is a 9. But how does the model know that this is a 9 or how does the model learn it? So, the way it learns is, you feed the machine different examples of different digits. So, different kind of zeros, ones, handwritten, twos, handwritten nines and so on. And the more examples that you will have, the better accuracy or better confidence that the machine will have in its prediction. So, the thing to highlight here is that the machine doesn't understand 9 the way you and I understand 9. The machine has no concept that 9 is a number, that 9 is greater than 8 or 9 is greater than 7. All it knows is that 9 is a series of 784 numbers and based on some statistical or mathematical calculations that the machine does, that series of number is most likely to be a 9. So, it's, it's purely a statistical exercise that the machine is doing. Now, classification might appear to be a trivial task, right? So, great, we can find the class or the category of an input. But actually, when you think of it, you can frame a lot of problems as classification problems, which you might, you might otherwise not think of it. For example, self-driving car. It is a classification problem. How? So, there's a camera fitted on, on the car. The camera sees an image. The image, in this particular case, the image is 120 by 320 pixels. And consequently, that is something like 38,000 numbers. These numbers are fed into the machine, uh, into the model. And now, instead of finding what the digit it is, or as in the previous case, here the model is trying to find, ident learn whether it should go left, right, forward, or reverse. So, even self-driving can be looked at as a classification problem. Again, this is not hypothetical. If you go on YouTube and you search Zhang Wang self-driving car, so, this person actually made a remote controlled car which, which learns to drive on itself. He fitted a camera on the top of it and this is just a frame from his uh, video. But if you see the center image, the, this is what the camera is seeing. The camera sees that the road is turning left and consequently the model is telling the car to turn left and the car turns left. Uh, it's an interesting video, you can go ahead and check it later. So, uh, coming to regression problems. Now, what separates regression from classification is that in case of classification, you have a pre, you have a small set of actions or classifications that you want to do. You can contrast this with something like house price prediction. Now, the price of house can be anything, right? Uh, it can be a few lakh rupees to crores of rupees. So, the possible values of your output is very large. In that case, uh, we use a regression model. So, in this particular case, you have size, this is a simplified example wherein you have size of the house and based on the size of the house, you want to predict what the price of the house is. 
if you look at it visually this is how it looks so we can see there is some relationship between the size and the price and this is actually what the algorithm tries to learn as to what is the relationship between the size of the house and its price and once the algorithm has learned that uh, formula then if you ask the algorithm the question what is the price of a house with size 750 square foot the algorithm can extrapolate what it has learned and give you the answer uh, coming to unsupervised learning so as i said in supervised learning we know what the output is so in the previous case we know we are trying to predict the size uh, price of the house in unsupervised learning we actually don't know what the output is so for example think of customer segmentation now let's say you have customers wherein you know the data of age and the dollars that the customers spend so you want to classify or categorize these customers into different segments so you can better market to them or you can devise better marketing strategies a clustering model can help you do that wherein in this particular case uh, the clustering model identifies that uh, the data has actually three segments there is uh, there are older age customers who spend less there are middle age customers who spend the most and there are young customers who again spend less so then you can take this data and uh, you know better target your customers there is other type of unsupervised learning called anomaly detection now this can be useful in examples like you want to add, you want to find if a particular machine part is faulty you have the data on the heat and the vibration generated by working machine parts so you know that all these machines parts are working fine you know that they work well and this is the heat uh, sorry this is the heat and this is the vibration that these parts generate now if you ask the model that there is a new part which generates heat and vibration which is somewhere in the middle of the pack the machine can tell you that this looks like normal this is what the normal range of heat and vibration is on the other hand if the heat and vibration is very different from what it has seen earlier then the machine or the algorithm will identify that this is an anomaly this is probably a most likely a faulty part so coming back to our original question which is what is driving the current ai spring why is ai currently a very hot topic so as we saw the different kind of models if you had to look at it very broadly the machine learning process is basically you take raw data you clean and label the data you build different kinds of algorithm models on it so when a data scientist is actually trying to build a model he doesn't really know which model will work the best so he'll try a couple of different types of models and then he'll do a model evaluation wherein on all on the different models he'll try to see which gives the best result so which gives the best housing price accuracy and once you finalized a model you go ahead and deploy the model so this stage from data cleaning to model evaluation is what is generally called model training if you have to look at an analogy from a manufacturing perspective this is this is something like an r and d setup wherein you are trying various different formulas for a product you are trying different things and once you are satisfied with something then you go ahead and mass produce it now based on this process we can understand that the more complicated or more complex your algorithm is the more data that it will need and the more computational power that it will need similarly if you have a lot of data you need more storage and more computational power so these are essentially the ingredients or the inputs to the process and this is actually what is driving the current ai spring so we've had major research breakthroughs we've had increasingly had more data availability computational power has increased and you have cloud which has made all this easily accessible to people so when you look at research so what these charts actually show is that the chart on the right shows the absolute number of artificial intelligence research papers published in uh, repositories like ssrn and agzip 
and from 2010 when there were something like 2000 papers published annually today uh, you have something like 50000 papers published annually so a lot of research is going into the field and it's not just on an absolute basis if you look at on a relative basis in 2010 2 to 3% of the overall papers came from artificial intelligence domain today that number is close to around 15% so of the total number of papers published around 15% are within this domain second when you look at data availability so if you are a data scientist if you are a researcher in the field you either developed a new algorithm or a model or you want to test or experiment on an existing model you can't do it unless you have good data and a decade back or 15 years back finding good data was a big challenge but today if you if you want to create an image detection uh, model you have data is like databases like imagenet which have 14 million images there is google open images which has 9 million images if you want to create a program or model that can understand user reviews then there is amazon review data which has about 233 million reviews these are all open sourced by the respective companies there is if you want to build a program a model that can identify malware so there is the sorel 20 million data which is database of 20 million malware files so availability of data has become much more easier coming to computational capability so what this chart shows is that at different points in history the major models that were there what kind of computational power they were using and if you see till 2010 the computational power that was available or that was utilized was growing at about 2x every 2 years so roughly in line with moore's law but from 2010 onwards the computational power that is available to train these algorithms has increased almost 10x every year what has lead led to this computational power is something we'll look at later on but essentially this is one of the big drivers that has helped people train very complex algorithms yeah so we've seen how computational power that is available to train algorithms has increased but at the same time the cost for computational power has gone down materially so if you want to train an algorithm with some threshold accuracy so in this case the researchers tried to estimate the cost of wanting to train an algorithm which has 93% accuracy on a database so the cost for training that algorithm from 2017 to 2021 has gone down from something like $1000 to you know close to around $5 today so computational power has actually become cheaper yeah now coming to the impact of ai on business or on organizations so you can actually look at the impact from as a pyramid wherein at the top you have businesses who are using artificial intelligence or machine learning for the increasing their own productivity or for their own solutions then you have companies that are helping or that are providing solutions to other companies in implementing artificial intelligence or machine learning models and at the bottom you have core infrastructure providers and whether you implement an algorithm yourself or you get a third party provider at the end of the day you need compute storage and cloud so you can look at the bottom two layers as picks and shovels and the top layer is actually your business application so let's start with the AI ML applications. So, one of the major applications of AI ML that has been developed in this particular spring since the last five seven years is natural language processing. And natural lang language processing is essentially about understanding the meaning of text. So, you can look at it through the example of Google search. So, essentially, when you are trying to search. the biggest job of the search engine is trying to understand what you intend to do and a lot of times it's not very clear so 
गूगल इंप्लीमेंटेड एन एन एल पी प्रोग्राम टू हेल्प इम्प्रूव इट सर्च एंड दे डेमोन्स्ट्रेटेड वॉट दैट प्रोग्राम हाउ दैट प्रोग्राम वॉज हेल्पफुल सो लेट से सर्च समबडी यूजर सर्च ब्राजील ट्रैवलर टू यू एस ए नीड अ वीजा नाउ वेन वी रीड दिस इट्स क्लियर टू अस दैट अ ट्रैवलर इज गोइंग फ्रॉम ब्राजील टू यू एस ए एंड ही इज ट्राइंग टू आस्क वेदर ही नीड्स अ वीजा और हाउ कैन ही ओप्टेन अ वीजा एंड सो ऑन नाउ बिफोर गूगल इम्प्लीमेंटेड दिस न्यू एन एल पी अलगोरिदम इट्स सर्च एंजिन द फर्स्ट रिजल्ट दैट इट शोड वॉज यू एस सिटीजन कैन ट्रैवल टू ब्राजील विदाउट द रेड टेप ऑफ वीजा now it's clear this is not what the user is asking for this is referencing for somebody going from us to brazil after they implemented the nlp algorithm now the search result is us embassy and uh, consultation in brazil so this is actually relevant for somebody who is going from brazil to usa and who is wanting a visa so the algorithm or google search engine can now better understand what the user is trying to say um, we've seen other examples of this uh, almost in our day to day life now in the example of chatbots wherein the chatbot tries to understand what the user is asking it the other example is comes from a company called luminance and what they do is so law firms have to go through a lot of legal documents or lot of legal reviews every day what the company has done is they have created an nlp based solution which goes through the legal documents and it identifies points of interest that the associate might need to review so it is not a full solution in, in itself it will not completely review or it will not completely edit the document by itself but what it will do is if the associate earlier had to go through thousands of pages to find what is of interest now it the associate can very quickly go identify what are those pages where which need review and that is essentially their pitch what they are claiming is earlier you needed three associates for full time now you can do the same task with two associates plus our software and it's much cheaper the other application of ai ml is computer vision so nanox ai has this solution which wherein it looks it can the model can evaluate the ct scan of or the cardiac ct scans and identify if the patient if there is a probability of future cardiac issues with that uh, based on that ct scan uh again this is not an hypothetical example this is actually an fda approved solution uh, aes is actually a power distribution company in us and they have many wind farms so wind farms have a lot of windmills and they need to periodically inspect if the windmills need any maintenance so the way that would it would usually happen earlier was there was a drone which will go through the wind farm it will take a lot of images of the windmills and then those images would be sent to a person for manual review the person would go through the images and see if any particular windmill has any problem now they have a model which can go through all the images and highlight that this particular region looks damaged or this particular region looks damaged and it might need maintenance the other application and this is something that we all used or have come across is recommendation systems so when you open an app like netflix or hotstar you get recommendations on what you should watch based on what you have already watched now netflix takes a lot of pride in its recommendation system or its recommendation engine and it claims that 80% of its user experience or its 80% of the views are because of what the recommendation engine suggested so this shows how for some companies machine learning is actually at the center of what they do tiktok takes this a step ahead so in case of facebook or in twitter you go ahead and add friends or you follow people and your feed is actually based on who you followed 
और हु योर फ्रेंड्स आर या सो एज आई वॉज सेंग इन केस ऑफ फेसबुक और ट्विटर हु यू फॉलो और हु योर फ्रेंड्स आर डिटरमाइंड वॉट यू सी इन केस ऑफ ट्विटर इट इज द रिकमेंडेशन एंजिन बेस्ड ऑन वॉट एवर यू ऑलरेडी सीन दैट सजेस्ट वॉट यू माइट लाइक सो मैन यू थिंक अबाउट इट ट्विटर एंटायर बिजनेस और द एंटायर ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इज एक्चुअली सेंटर्ड अराउंड इट्स रिकमेंडेशन सिस्टम देन यू हैव द एग्जाम्पल ऑफ फ्रॉड डिटेक्शन सो स्ट्राइप विच इज अ पेमेंट सोल्यूशन कंपनी हैज अ सोल्यूशन कॉल रेडार विच हेल्प्स इट्स क्लाइंट्स आइडेंटिफाई इफ अ पर्टिकुलर ट्रांजेक्शन इज फ्रॉड्यूलेंट analytics and credit quality evaluation so fundbox is an interesting company they provide credit short term credit to small and medium enterprises in the us and the way they evaluate the credit quality is they have a system which has a machine learning model underneath and that system will integrate with the customer's accounting system or his bank account so the customer if he is using a zo quickbooks or into it or whatever if the customer gives access to that their system will pull data from it and very quickly calculate whether that person should be given a loan and how much loan should be given so a process that would take the other organizations probably days they can do it much quickly or at least that's what their pitch is so uh, there are two books that helped me to grasp around this idea of how ai can transform organizations uh, one is competing in the age of ai it has lots of examples of companies that are adapting or using ai it has examples on how leadership is adapting towards ai how leadership is bringing organizational changes to make their companies ai ready the other book is prediction machines uh this is this takes a very different and interesting view on the entire problem so the author of pred, authors of prediction machines are actually economists and they take an economists view of the entire thing so uh essentially what they are saying is that ai will make predictions or making predictions very cheap and consequently there will be in a lot of business units uncertainty will go down at the same time what they say is that predictions and judgment are two different things so for example if there is a credit card company and it is deciding it wants to evaluate the credit quality or credit worthiness of the client a machine learning model can help them evaluate the credit worthiness very accurately but that's not the end of it so just like we have sibil scores ranging from across a wide range of numbers the credit worthiness will be across a wide range of numbers then you need judgment to decide where it is that you want your organization to be placed do you want to be with the extremely safest clients wherein you might not have a lot of yield or do you want to be somewhere in the middle do you want the most riskiest clients and that is where judgment comes in so essentially any decision can be broken down into predictions and judgments machine learning can help you with making very good predictions or very accurate predictions but the judgment will still have to be done by humans the other interesting aspect from the book is they have this concept of complements so for example for coffee sugar and cream are complements so when usage coffee becomes cheap or coffee becomes abundant people start using coffee a lot more it increases the value of sugar and cream similarly data and judgment are complements for the machine learning process so as as machine learning becomes more and more prevalent data and judgment human judgment essentially will actually become more and more valuable rather than its value decreasing so we've seen how machine learning or ai is transforming or has a lot of business applications and for some companies like tiktok it is at the center of what they do yet if you look at a lot of surveys a lot of these surveys from organizations like gartner show that almost 60 to 80% of machine learning projects actually don't get deployed so we saw the machine learning process wherein you have the machine model training phase which we equated to an r and d phase 
and then there is a model deployment phase which is wherein the model is actually used in practice so what these surveys show is that almost 60 to 80 percent of projects are actually not getting deployed they stay in the r&d phase so there are two major issues that come across when organizations try to implement machine learning first issue is the data challenge so in organization data actually is very messy so the first problem is each department whether it's sales marketing finance or operations each has their own separate tools and databases so sales might be using a salesforce finance might be using some accounting software marketing ha might have their uh, some other data source and consequently there is no single data source that is available so if you want to build a machine learning model that utilizes all these data sources it is actually very difficult because your data is siloed across multiple different organizations um, divisions the second issue is as we saw a lot of the machine learning applications use new kind of data images video audio the existing databases are or were de developed and are meant for tables of numbers so they don't adapt very well to this new kind of data third in a lot of cases the data comes from an external vendor so for example in finance your you might be using data from a bloomberg or a capital iq or a factset and you have very little control over what these organizations do in terms of their data or how they present their data so bloomberg might decide to change the ticker of any company factset might decide to do that and then if you are using that data your model is now needs to be reconfigured so having a clean uniform data throughout the organization is a big challenge for a lot of companies second machine learning or using machine learning is just now not about creating a machine learning code there is a lot of support infrastructure both human and technological that needs to be implemented for you to successfully implement machine learning so for example we we saw how data needs to be cleaned for it to be utilized in the model now once you deploy the model you want the entire process to be automated you can't have somebody cleaning the data every day or every week you want that entire piece to be automated the model should run seamlessly you also want the output of that model to be continuously monitored why because you have trained the model on some historical data but things change world evolves customer demand evolves so the new world may not be the same as what you have trained the model on and you will not know whether the world has changed or not unless you are actually monitoring the outputs of the model so you need a lot of ancillary infrastructure around a machine learning code the th a problem in conjunction with this is that from a human resource perspective data scientists have their forte in statistics or math they are not software engineers so for them to build software or to automate all this stuff is not easy now software engineers on the other hand are good at software engineering but they don't have their forte in statistics or machine learning so a lot of times they will not be able to understand what the data scientist wants out of the software so you need a team of data scientists and software engineers that can work together and give you a solution which again a lot of organizations find difficult so this uh, image is actually from a paper by google called hidden technical debt in machine learning systems and essentially what it shows is that this tiny black box is machine learning code it is a very small part of the overall infrastructure there is a lot of surrounding systems that you need for the machine learning code to actually be useful so as investor this brings us to an interesting thought that organizations who actually have good data or machine learning infrastructure 
can have a competitive advantage versus some of the other organizations who don't have this. So, to give an example, Facebook says that their Looper platform, which is a platform they use to create machine learning models, can host 700 AI models and generate 4 million outputs per second. So, that is a kind of infrastructure they have developed. Um, in the book, Competing in the Age of AI, you have an example of Microsoft wherein they mentioned that what they did was all their data was consolidated in one central database. And what they are saying is we now have the capability to build a machine learning model on any data that we want and very quickly. So we don't have to go through a lengthy process of trying to consolidate data or build this infrastructure. Having this infrastructure also helps companies in another way, it, that is to recruit talent. So what this chart, which is not very clearly visible, shows is that top five researchers, machine learning researchers from top five universities, they actually prefer to work with the largest big tech companies. Why? Because if they have a model, these big tech companies have the infrastructure that can evaluate and deploy that model. A lot of the other companies can't do that. The same thing is actually true for hiring talent as well. Uh, there is a Google Brain employee who left Google Brain and uh, then he blogs. Uh, if you search Eric Jang, you can find his blog. And what he, as he was trying to search for a job, he, man, he shares his own thoughts on, you know, uh, while talking to industry people. And he mentions how researchers in, in the industry don't want to work with anybody outside the big tech because it will take them years to build a supporting infrastructure that will take them to the place where big tech are today. So having this infrastructure can be a big competitive advantage. So having seen the applications and the challenges, we can now appreciate the companies that are working to address these challenges. Essentially the picks and shovels. So we saw how creating a model is a cumbersome process. You need a lot of different uh, systems. Data scientists have their own tools. Software engineers have their own tools. So essentially, as data robot, which is one of the organizations that does it, it's a complicated process. What data robot does is they have a cloud based solution wherein you can develop the model, you can deploy the model and you can monitor the model all through the same interface. So the data scientists, the software engineers, every, all of them can use the same interface and, uh, work towards deploying a model. This is what is called machine learning as a service. So essentially transforming the entire process on the cloud. So what are the companies that are trying to solve this or trying to provide this? Uh, you have data robot, you have h2o.ai, data IQ, c3.ai, and then you have the big cloud players who have their own solutions that provide something similar. You have AWS, you have as your vertex.ai is a, a Google solution and you have IBM's machine learning. Uh, again, this is a nascent field. People are only starting now starting to appreciate that having a machine learning infrastructure is a big challenge and a single solution will be helpful. And consequently, a most of these companies are relatively small. So if we look at data robot, which is one of the bigger ones has just about $200 million in revenue right now. Then you have machine learning solution providers and uh, the pitch here essentially is you don't need to create or train your own machine learning model for a specific application. We will do it for you. So for example, there is nice.ai which specializes in chatbots. So they have trained NLP based chatbots and so if you are an organization who wants to deploy chatbots, you don't need to do the entire process yourself. You can take the solution from nice.ai, customize it a bit and deploy it. Similarly, we saw the case of Luminance, 
which is in the legal domain wherein again a law firm doesn't need to create the entire legal document review solution on itself it can take it from luminance similarly across organizations or across segments there are these kind of companies so in marketing there is a company called gum gum and what they do is they help their clients in digital marketing so they tell the clients which are or their algorithm can help clients know which sites they should place their ads on so they have nlp and computer vision which will go through a web page and try and understand what that web page is all about is it about food is it about travel or something and then once it has categorized a web page it will tell the client this suits your product the next companies in this space are data providers so again if you are in the financial service industry you'll use data from somebody like bloomberg factset s&p global if you want to build models you'll essentially have to rely on some of these data providers uh, if you are in the oil and gas industry there is tgs which has geospatial uh, data which oil and gas can companies can use to build models on and identify where there might be potentials for oil and gas discovery and if you are in the pharma industry you might have equia which is uh, which you might know by ims health so which provides data on pharmaceutical industry so coming next to the core infrastructure providers and one of the core infrastructures is data warehouses or data lakes so as we saw the traditional databases ha have an issue one there are data silos each division of the company is using a separate database or a data structure second these traditional databases they are not very well adapted towards file formats like audio image or video so what data lakes do is they provide a solution for this by saying one you don't need many different database providers for different types of data you dump all the data that you have in a data lake so it will take everything whether it's an image video tables of data whatever second these are cloud based so increasing the data storage capacity or compute capacity or reducing it is much easier than an on premise database wherein you need a database administrator increasing the storage might lead to you buying additional hardware and so on or you need a specialized software in this case it's cloud based you pay the you buy the subscription and it's good to go the other interesting invention that these guys came up with was they separated the cost for storage and compute so earlier what was happening is as organizations realized that they need data is an important resource they started storing data they realized that we might not need the data today but we might need it 5 years later when we are actually building a model so they organizations especially organization like facebook google they started every data storing every data that ca they can but at the same time they also realized that at any given point of time we are probably using only 20 30% of that data for our processing the rest of the data is just lying so what the data lake providers pitched to them is we will separate the storage and compute cost for you so storage cost is very cheap so you can store as much data as you want there will be no compute cost on it so long as you are not doing any processing only when you do some processing you pay us the compute cost so the pioneers in this field are snowflake and databricks and it's an interesting rivalry if you read about it as to how they have different approaches to the same problem and they are coming to it from very different directions but essentially at this point of time both have similar offerings which is data lakes and once again you have the cloud players also eating into the territory so you have amazon redshift as your google bigquery which also offer similar solutions as these um, again you can see the kind of explosive growth that databricks has seen wherein in 2000 the company actually started in 2015 and today has something like 600 million in annual revenues 
so we saw this chart earlier which showed that models are increasingly using more computational power or they're demanding more computational power and that is actually increasing something like 10x every year so what is leading to this so if you are like me you would most likely associate nvidia with its gaming chips so if you're a gamer you need an nvidia graf graphics card which costs a lot to play games but as the deep learning revolution was happening researchers realized that i can run the same algorithm with the same amount of data much faster on a gpu than on a cpu why because a gpu allowed them to do lot of parallel computations so essentially in deep learning or in machine learning you have thousands or millions of examples and you are doing the same computation across all the examples so if i can do that stuff parallelly across all the examples it will greatly speed up my process and that is what gpus allowed them to do now to its credit nvidia is not the only company that makes gpus a lot of other companies make makes graphics card but what makes what made nvidia stand out was you can't simply take a model or a code that was written for running on a cpu and run it on a gpu it won't work you need an underlying software or a library that will help you run that code on a gpu and that is where nvidia through its cuda libraries made a got a big advantage so they were ahead of everybody else in creating these libraries and training researchers on how they can deploy deploy and train their models on gpus so you can see how this entire process has revolutionized the company in itself so this is nvidia's gaming revenues it has grown at 25% kager over the last 5 years so or by any means a very great achievement uh, so it, they were about 5 and 1/2 billion 5 years back uh, this year they are close to around 12 billion or something if you see the data center revenues this is essentially where the machine learning based graphics cards are come in this was about a 2 billion dollar a year business 5 years back today it is about 11 billion dollars a year and this year it will actually most likely surpass the gaming revenues so in 5 years it has grown at 65% kager and it's almost at a similar space to its division of gaming wherein it has existed for more than a decade so uh, i like this because this is one of the few cases wherein you can directly see the impact ai or machine learning is having on business and its growth so now companies like google or facebook they weren't even satisfied with gpus they said you know gpus are fine they're great they are helping us do faster processing but we want even more so they went to chip specialized chip designers these are companies like marvel broadcom graphcore cerebras and that they, they told them design chips for us that will only do deep learning but do it very fast and so google calls their chips tpus and uh, broadcom helped with them in the design process now broadcom is a chip designer which does a lot of things and uh, this is one of the things that they started doing so they don't break out what kind of revenues or earnings they have from this business but according to some analysts this business was about 50 million in annualized revenues in 2017 so that is when google started developing these chips uh um, right now that business is close to around 1 billion in annualized revenues again they don't disclose it so we can't verify it but uh, this is what analysts are estimating so from 50 million to 1 billion annualized revenues and finally you have the cloud so whether you are using a database like snowflake or databricks or you want to use nvidia's data centers you will ultimately have to rely on one of the underlying clouds to deliver that to you so you know you have companies like aws azure and google cloud and obviously there are other cloud companies but these are the big three majors who are helping companies access either the data storage or the computational power so 
finally coming to the limitations of this entire AI machine learning, deep learning revolution. So, first of all, when you look at artificial intelligence, people classify it actually into three different categories. One is artificial narrow intelligence. This is essentially wherein the machine can do one task very well. Then there is artificial general intelligence, wherein the same model or the same machine can do multiple tasks very well. So it's similar to a human. And then you have artificial super intelligence, which is essentially something like a terminator. So now if you look at current systems, they are at best artificial narrow intelligence. So you train a model to do something, it only does that. You train a model to evaluate the credit quality of a customer, that's all that it can do. Now, the reason they are narrow is because these systems have no knowledge or no concept of common sense. So, as I showed in the example of that digit classification, the machine really doesn't understand that what a 9 means or what a 0 means. It is simply making a statistical calculation. So, some of the problems that humans can solve very easily. So, for example, there is this group of problems called Bongard's problems. And what is it that separates this set of images from this set of images? So, one on the left to one on the right. And if you actually give it some thought, you will start to appreciate that the one on the left are all triangles, the one on the right are not all triangles. So, we can do this very quickly. But machine learning systems cannot do this. They can't identify what is the difference between the two. And Jan Le Kun, who is one of the prominent researchers in this field, puts it as that a teenager who is learning to drive a car, he doesn't have to drive the car off a cliff to know that it's a bad idea. He understands a bit of physics, he understands biology, he knows that it's a bad idea. But a machine learning or an artificial intelligence powered self-driving car will have to do it thousands of times, even if it's only in simulation, to know that driving a car off a cliff is a bad idea. Sorry. So, current systems are missing common sense language, which is why they are data hungry and rigid. The second problem is that real life, real world is very different from training examples. So, so there is this company that said in a, in a soccer match, the camera should follow the soccer ball. And uh, so they said, why don't we create a artificial intelligence based camera that will track the soccer ball. So that problem of somebody having to manually follow that soccer ball will be solved. What they didn't realize was that in the actual game, the referee was bald. So the camera, rather than following the soccer ball, it started following the referee's head. So oftentimes, if you miss the real world data or what happens in the real world, your model will lead you astray. Now, this is a bit of a harmless mistake, but sometimes these mistakes can be very costly. So Zillow is as essentially a real estate marketplace wherein people come for buying and selling of houses. So they bid, they place their houses on the marketplace for somebody to buy or if they want to sell it, they'll place it to sell it. Now, what Zillow said was, we have all this data. Why don't we create an algorithm? They called it Zestimate, which will try to predict the price of the house. So similar to the example that we saw. And based on that algorithm, if the price of the house is or the fair value of that house is more than what the customer has put it for, I'll go ahead and buy it. And in the process, and later on, I will sell it for the fair value and make millions out of this entire process. But what happened is, after some months or probably about a year, they had to take a 500 million write down. They took a lot of losses on the houses that they bought, assuming that their model was perfect and it was predicting the right prices. Now, Zillow did not say, it simply said that, you know, the model didn't work as planned and we are shutting it down. They didn't say what went wrong. And so, but one of the theories uh, behind 
what went wrong is that real estate is a perverse market it is not like a stock market wherein you can buy or sell stocks at the market price at least on the liquid stocks in case of real estate it's a perverse market in the sense that there is a bidding that takes place so if a customer has put in a house for a particular value you you will bid for it and if your bid what would happen is if your estimate was actually lower than what the fair value was the customer will not sell it to you only when your estimate was incorrect and you were bidding higher than what the fair price was only then the customer would sell it to you so zillow would have actually bid for a lot of houses but in it only got those houses wherein est its estimate was very incorrect so again they are missing out on the real world dynamics of that domain so there are a lot of other concerns with the current models so first they are very data inefficient so as we saw in case of image detection and so on you have databases with millions of examples and when you have millions of examples many of these machine learning models work very well but in a lot of domains you don't have millions of examples you have probably few thousands of examples in that kind of an environment the machine learning model will not work very well now again there is a lot of research happening in this domain which is called zero shot learning and few shot learning which is essentially about how can we train machines to learn from very few examples so humans learn from few examples very easily if i show you a picture of a cat i don't need to show you thousands of pictures you will know that this is a cat just after a few pictures the next problem is that many of these algorithms are black boxes so you don't know how it arrived at a particular output and in many of the domains this can be a severe problem for example in domains like banking or regulatory domains right a bank denies loan to a customer and later on if the regulator asks the bank why did you deny the loan or inversely the bank gives the loan to a customer and the regulator asks why did you give a loan the bank cannot simply say the model suggested it to me so unless you know how the model arrives at that decision you cannot use that model finally there are ethical and fairness concerns so what happens in a training of these models is that the training it data itself might be biased so one example of this is amazon created a model to screen resumes and so it had historical data on the candidates that had successfully or that had succeeded in the recruiting process based on that data it created a model to identify or screen resumes after a while they realized that the model was penalizing any term that was associated with women so if a candidate had said that i played in women's basketball or women's soccer the model was assigning a negative at negative score to it why because in the historical data whatever that was the model had seen mostly men going through that process now nobody or the person who was creating the model didn't consciously put in a bias but it was the training data that was biased and the worst thing is since you have not consciously or you don't know that there is a bias you will not realize it until well after you have utilized the model for quite a while so there is this very good book called the alignment problem which discusses all these problems and many more uh, in quite a great depth finally the key question if machines are taking over the world what about us so there is this book called deep medicine and the author is a doctor but he is also he understands ai and deep learning very well and this is a very good book because it provides a very balanced view of the advantages and the disadvantages of ai and while it's from a doctor's perspective i think the lessons are equally applicable to other domains so one of the things is humans and ai make very different kind of errors so we know humans are not very good at statistical or probabilistic reasoning we know humans suffer from behavioral biases but at the same time 
AI has its own set of issues that we saw. They don't have common sense. They can't learn from very less data. They won't, if the data is bad, the learning will be bad. So if you combine the knowledge from both a human and a AI, then you are likely to have a much better outcome than if you are only relying on either one of them. It makes an interesting point that AI can actually free up the human to do much more productive tasks. So for example, today doctors have hardly any time to give to the patient wherein, you know, you, the doctors really don't have enough time to spend and understand what the patient is going through and all that. If AI can free up that time, then doctors can actually do much more productive work. So, you know, it gives an example of how spreadsheets didn't eliminate accountants, but rather made them more valuable because accountants were now asking more relevant questions. So finally, uh, you know, to summarize, AI isn't magic. It won't do a, a single model or AI won't do everything that you want it to do, but it can be a great productivity tool. It can help increase productivity in a lot of domains. So that's it. I'll just conclude with these two books. Uh, these are very broad books. It didn't fit in anywhere in just one segment, but uh, if there is only one book that you want to read on the subject, then I would suggest Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. Uh, it's a very good book, covers applications, covers limitations, all that. If you are interested in understanding the intuition behind the algorithms, then The Master Algorithm is a very good book. This is actually the book that got me interested into this entire subject. He goes through different kind of algorithms and intuitively expa explains how they learn. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Rukun. Uh, we'll go with the in-person audience first if you have any questions. And then we'll go to the Zoom audience. Hi. Hi. So, my question is, uh, as far as I have seen the use of AI and ML techniques in finance, I've been on the credit field. And fraud detection, credit card uh, scoring and stuff, right? Yeah. How much of this is painted into core finance, which is trading and investment decisions in your opinion? So, I have personally seen most of machine learning being used for short term trading stuff. So, and the reason is that the more shorter your time horizon, the more data you have. So, if you are, if you are a day trader or if you are trading at, you know, at 15 minute or 10 minute horizons, then the amount of data that you have explodes because each day you will have multiple data points. The more longer you go on the time horizon, one, the amount of data that you have actually decreases. And second, the variables that can impact the decision making materially increases. So if you are a short term trader, probably all that matters to you is price and volume, right? But if you are thinking of investing with a three year, five year perspective, then there are hundreds of variables that can impact that decision. So a combination of low data plus lot of variables makes it a very difficult task. So I have also not seen cases wherein it has been successfully applied to long term investments. On the short term horizon, yes, there are people that use it. So trading, market making, those are the areas that it does get used. So my question is, since data is a raw material for the AI, yeah. so like, you know, most of the data gets outdated also over the time. So while building a model, so, you know, since there's a lot of data also, so like how it is easy to, you know, understand that, you know, some of this data is, you know, are being outdated or how it comes to know because data can't be constant. And over the time, if we think that way, so output can also be, you know, comes wrong. Mm -hmm. So, example, let's say in finance stream, if mm -hmm. let's say through a data, we come to know that, you know, this person is eligible for this loan, let's say. Yeah. But like over the time, if his income increases or some variable increases, you know, that he, he might be more eligible for the loan or might be less vice versa. Right. So like since like how challenge or like how easy is for them, you know, to, get, you know, keep going and changing the data. Right. So that is actually a big challenge and which is what I highlighted that data continuously changes. 
now at what frequency it is important to change your model accordingly is where in the domain knowledge of somebody who is building that model comes in so we spoke of data scientists and software engineers at two as two components of or two people who build the model but there is actually a third very important person in there a person who has the domain knowledge so a person who has the domain knowledge of that field can tell you whether it makes sense to update the model monthly yearly or whatever right so you can address that problem if you have good domain knowledge of that problem so we are not at a stage wherein you simply feed in all the data in the algorithm and the algorithm will decide where what to do with it you need somebody with good domain knowledge thank you hi just one question yeah uh, how evolved is the ai space in uh, in india because uh, as per my knowledge we don't have any listed uh, companies in this space so how is this uh, space kind of evolving in, in the country yeah so we do not have any pure play listed companies but there are companies like latent view analytics which i would classify as service providers so we saw the model building phase wherein you want clean data then you create the model uh, there as model production there is deployment and so on so what these companies will do is that they will help their clients in one of those phases so they might help them in creating a clean database or implement a database across the organization or for specific projects they might help them build a model so i think that is the only example of a listed company that i know uh, which does some of it or which is involved in some part of this but in your opinion why is the space not taken off you know as it should have in india no that's not actually true i mean there are a lot of startups that are doing this uh, you know across whether it's uh, uh, you know creating chatbots and stuff but uh, it's mostly on the unlisted space that uh, people have experimented with it thanks hello so yeah. my question is how about application of uh, ai in arbitrage mutual funds because it's about capturing the price and how speedily a, a machine can accelerate it is so there are algorithms or there are codes that do arbitrage even today um you don't need a complicated machine learning algorithm to actually execute that it is essentially about going through the data of what arbitrage is available and then capturing that arbitrage so there are algorithms which do al arbitrage trading even today in case of a mutual fund setup obviously it's it's difficult because there is a regulatory aspect to it as well uh, but as such there are algorithms that can make uh, arbitrage trades I just want to understand in your view as to where are the Chinese on this because see largely whatever we read up is largely what the Western companies are working on. Mm. But if you see what happened uh, in terms of, for example, face recognition, right? The Chinese yeah. are way ahead, right? right. In Hong Kong and yeah. everywhere, right? So, yeah. is there any sort of content available or resources to understand where they are on this? Right. So there is a state of AI report that is available. There is an index of AI report that is available. and uh, then there are references within these reports that you can find and uh, my understanding of the space comes from those references and they are very good so they uh, you know in a lot of these technologies like facial recognition and so on and even in other technologies uh, they have spent a lot of time and effort to build that capability so uh, i think you know they are actually competing well with the us on that aspect today the chinese file more patents in the us yeah so i think it is either the state of ai report or the index of ai report that actually has all that data and uh, it corroborates a lot of what you are saying that uh, this is one of their key focus areas in terms of science there's also a book i forgot the name but i can get back to you uh, wherein the author actually is comparing and does a has a in depth study on the exact same topic wherein he is looking at the us industry and the us is approach to artificial intelligence and contrast it with the chinese approach to artificial intelligence and what they are doing and so on so i'll just have to google it but uh, that book is also very good on that
That's one other question. See, in terms of, for example, what you say, common sense and judgment. Yeah. Right, that a machine can't do that. If you think about it, and I think that's the holy grail. In a sense, it's actually really about uh, how much data is thrown at the problem, right? In a sense, human intuition is about that we have a lot more data as compared to the machine, which is where we come with judgment. For example, yeah. common sense not to jump off the cliff is yeah. 5,000 years of data to say that's a stupid thing to do. So yeah. The machine doesn't have that yeah. data, right? It's yeah. not something we've acquired. So I think one of the things that, so I don't, I want to just understand on that because uh, the holy grail that everybody's talking about is that if you keep throwing data continuously and your processing yeah. power keeps improving, yeah. at some power you, point you will reach there. So, uh, my own understanding of the topic is that that's actually not true. In the sense, one, you are right, there is an inherent understanding that we are born with. So, a baby, as soon as it's born, it knows what is dangerous or it, it at least understands it very quickly. Versus, as we saw in the example of, let's say, a self-driving car, it takes thousands and thousands of examples for it to do. So, uh, I think, uh, so there is a podcast of Jan Le Kun with Lex Friedman that it's a two-hour podcast on exactly the same topic and he is a prominent researcher on this field and what he's saying that it is not only about data there is some mechanism in us which helps us understand very different mental models so you have a model of how the physics operates you have a mental of mental model of chemistry biology the world and all that today even researchers like Jan Le Kun don't know how we can create machines that can have all these separate models and when making a decision integrate the outputs from all these separate models. So it, in individual domains or with single applications probably we might reach there. So simply self-driving car probably I don't know but you know in a given setting you keep doing it for 10 years, 5 years or whatever and you might reach there. But to reach to that AGI level, it is not simply about having more data. And so one of the key critics of this entire paradigm is a person called Gary Marcus. And he has a book called Rebooting AI. So if you read that book, it's essentially about what is what all is wrong with the current thought process. And that current thought process of a lot of researchers is that we will just throw more computational power and data on it and it will learn on its own. So, I am sort of in that camp wherein that is not enough. So, still AI is not there. Like you talked about it goes through the boom and bust. and the, So, do you think that it will again go through the bust? So, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, but it, it depends on, uh, you know, how the current set of researchers play the entire hype cycle. So at this point of time, a lot of researchers or a lot of scientists do have that tendency to make these tall claims. So, uh, you know, just on the topic that we were discussing, a few days back, one of the researchers claimed that he said scaling up is all we need, which is essentially we'll just create more and more models more and more computational power and we'll reach there. So, uh, I think it's more than actually going through that booms and bursts. It's about researchers pro over promising and then failing to deliver. So, at this point of time, I don't think my personal view is I don't think we'll see a lot of applications that are today being promised in the next five, seven years. But this self-driving car is uh, making lots of good progress. and. Uh... So, but even enough. there, uh, you've had uh, statements from Elon Musk that, you know, it will not run in so-and-so city because, so it runs well in cities wherein you have clear infrastructure, you have clear lane markings, everybody's following the driving rules and so on. In cities wherein that is not the case, it may not work. So, in in narrow conditions, there is definitely a usage and it's definitely working. But when you put it in scenarios and environments which are not clearly defined, then it struggles. So, I think when we've been hearing that we'll have a full self-driving car by Tesla almost every year now. So, I 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Whenever things got rough, I always remember what my father used to say. Running a business does test a man, my son. There are ups and downs. Glorious eyes. And sometimes a low that leaves you feeling defeated. The character of a man and the character of a business are not very different, are they? Yes. But when the chips are down, we must stand up. Dust ourselves off and motor on. Volatility. It's a funny thing. It makes you question yourself and wonder if you've made all the right decisions. Sure, you can question some of your decisions, but stay steadfast on your goals. Dad always said, there are no shortcuts and no quick profits. There are no free lunches, are there? There is only one right way. At PPFAS, we think like Rahul and his father. That volatility is a fact of running a business. And buying equity shares is like owning a part of that business. We use value investing principles to manage your money. This means we invest in the right businesses at reasonable prices and for a longer term. PPFAS Mutual Fund. There's only one right way. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.